Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of our conference, The Philippines, Spain, and Globalization, 16th Century to the Present. And for our session six, we have here in this room, panel 6A, Spanish representations of the Chinese in the Philippines, 16th to 20th centuries. We have four speakers, and I will let them speak one after the other after these introductions. Uh, first speaker is Diego Javier Luis of Brown University, who will deliver a paper titled Co-Colonization in Manila, Chinese Settler Colonialism Within a Spanish Colony at the Turn of the 17th Century. Second is Luis uh, Casaldi uh, with the title Xenophobia in the Spanish Philippines uh, from University of Manchester. And then third speaker is Richard Chu of University of Massachusetts with a paper titled Tales of Two Empires, Comparing the Spanish and American Racial Discourses of the Chinese Labor in the Philippines during the late 19th century and early 20th century. And lastly, uh, Rocio Ortuño of University of Antwerp uh, with a paper titled Peripheries Want to Go West, Negotiation of Spanish and Philippine Identities over the Representation of China in fiction in the 1920s. And so let me turn you over to the first speaker, uh, Diego. You may now begin sharing your slides. May we request everyone to turn off their audio and video uh, throughout, uh, throughout the panel discussions. All right, thank you for the, uh, the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. I just have one image that I'm gonna put up uh, while I speak for you all to look at. Um, and just a, a slight uh, modification to the introduction. I, I just graduated from Brown and I'm at Davidson College now. Uh, and this material that I'm giving to you today uh, in a talk called Co-Colonization in Manila, Chinese Settler Colonialism Within a Spanish Colony at the Turn of the 17th Century. Uh, it's material drawn from a dissertation I just finished at Brown. Uh, and I'm excited to share this work here, particularly because uh, I think that some popular and academic discourses often assume a kind of hegemonic Spanish control uh, in uh, Manila and in the Philippines more generally, uh, and influence in their colonies. And I'm here uh, today to talk about one aspect of why that conception is uh, particularly inaccurate for the early modern uh, Philippines. So by the turn of the 17th century, the Spanish Empire, of course, extended well beyond the Americas to the Philippines. Every year, a ship or two sailed in either direction across the Pacific, carrying luxury goods, um, as well as uh, enslaved Asians and East Africans. Uh, we call these trans-Pacific vessels the Manila Galleons, and they connected a zone of imper imperial control uh, and imagination and colonial incursion now known as the Spanish Pacific. Despite the ambitions embedded in such a phrase, the Spanish Pacific actually consisted of only these few ships and the scattered colonies in Pacific littorals where Spaniards themselves uh, were always demographic minorities. The extreme limitations of Spanish power projection both territorially and culturally and their colonies worldwide were indeed exacerbated in unique ways in their Pacific colonies. So some of the clearest examples we have of Spanish vulnerability come through encounters, interdependence, and conflicts with the Chinese in the Philippines. So exploring the ways in which Spain was not the only colonial or imperial power in the early Philippines opens new avenues for challenging age-old colonial power relations that rely exclusively on a European to indigenous gradient. Such simplistic binaries exclude the complexities of colonial encounters and for my immediate purposes, the enormous numbers of Chinese merchants and laborers that visited and migrated to the Philippines every year. So Tonio Andrade has given us the useful framework of co-colonization to examine colonial cooperation, coercion, and competition uh, among European powers and Ming China. In his landmark study on Dutch and Chinese settlements in Taiwan, Andrade writes that though the Chinese and Dutch were unequal partners in the colonization of Taiwan, they were fundamentally interdependent and hybrid entities. Elsewhere, he clarifies that 
uh, with, uh, quote, the colony was in essence a Chinese settlement under Dutch rule, end quote. At the risk of simplifying complex histories, the early Philippines make perhaps an even more explicit case for co-colonization. And here we have to understand colonization as not only uh, uh, the explicit purview of the state, but also uh, constructed as well by individuals and communities. So the benefit of applying this perspective is to destabilize assumptions of Spanish power and influence in the region, as well as emphasize understudied Chinese-Filipino connections and conflicts. The threat of Chinese influence and control, imagined or not, to Spaniards was so profound that Spaniards themselves often addressed uh, these threats with violence, culminating in the 1603 war um, of ethnic extermination. So this talk uses evidence from the pre-1603 period to ultimately argue that the fear of Chinese influence over Filipinos in Manila ought to motivate us to question this historiographical language and constructs that assume, imply, or explicitly indicate Spanish imperial hegemony in the region. This was a period of extreme instability, and Manila was, at best, a contested colony with co-colonial features that often did not express a power gradient favorable to Spaniards. The history of the Chinese in the Philippines long predates uh, Spanish 16th century arrival, of course, uh, by roughly 600 years. The 100 years or so before Spanish arrival saw increasing connections between the South China coast and the Philippines through yearly trading tributary embassies uh, from numerous Filipino polities to the Chinese mainland and the emergence of small settled Chinese populations, particularly in the Rajanate of Manila. So rather than signal a break from pre-Hispanic contact, the formation of Spanish colonial societies, particularly in the Visayas and on Luzon, intensified Chinese trading and settlement in the Philippines. The first Spanish officials and missionaries welcomed into the Chinese imperial court took up the role of tributary supplicant and effectively facilitated the extension of a Chinese sphere of influence to Manila and numerous other enclaves throughout the islands. The influx of Spanish silver coincided with the Ming monetary transition to silver coinage, the repeal of the hygiene in 1550, which was the sea trade ban, and the opening of Yuegang, a port uh, in Fujian in 1567. The explicit establishment of Spaniards in Manila in 1571 sparked a period of massive trade growth and Chinese migration uh, that peaked at the turn of the 17th century when Spanish officials estimated a population of 30,000 Chinese in the Farian of Manila during the trading season. And the colony was simply unsustainable without them. This extreme demographic disparity between the many Chinese, the vast majority not converted to Catholicism, and few Spaniards created tensions unique in Spanish empire over cultural influence with native Filipino populations. In the Spanish imaginary, Filipinos, like other peoples given the Indio designation, were considered malleable in their beliefs. This was both an advantage for missionaries trying to instill Catholic customs and a disadvantage because said Indios could easily be drawn back into paganism. So the Chinese pirate Limahong gives us an early challenge to the pretension of Spanish hegemony over Filipino polities during his war against the Spaniards in 1574. After failing to take Manila, Lima Hong declared himself a king in Pangasinan and according to Spanish observers, successfully exacted tribute and obeisance from villages along the Pangasinan River. Furthermore, Spaniards relied heavily upon Visayan intervention to fight because many Filipinos of Luzon had aided the Chinese pirate by burning Spanish ships. As we know, though, Lima Hong was eventually defeated, which ultimately brought Manila closer to the Chinese mainland and trade opportunities. The subsequent massive influx of traders and laborers, primarily from, from Fujian, further destabilized Spanish pretensions of cultural influence over Filipinos. Though the Chinese were largely confined to the Farian, Chinese-Filipino coalitions formed instantly. These ties were economic, spiritual, and affective. As contact between the Chinese and Filipinos of Luzon increased, so too did Spanish fear 
that their cultural influence was being eclipsed and that their neophytes in the Catholic faith would be corrupted back into paganism. These fears centered around three key categories. One, sexuality, two, ritual, and three, land possession. To Spaniards, the dangers of Chinese sexual influence in Filipino communities revolved around what they termed sodomy, the pecado nefando. Miguel de Benavides, Archbishop of the Philippines, would describe sodomy as Chinese men giving gifts to Filipino boys they had seen bathing nude. These forms of patronage and sexual alliance were in fact common in Fujianese seafaring communities and represented the threat of non-dogmatic multi-ethnic coalition building operating outside of Spanish control. Unable to tolerate these perceived transgressions, the first public executions of Chinese for sodomy occurred in 1588. In 1597, former governor Luis Perez das Mariñas used evidence of sodomy to argue that Chinese were fundamentally unconvertible, unassimilable, and deserved expulsion from the Philippines. Chinese cultural and legal ritual further complicated these strained relations. In 1592, Spanish administrators banned Chinese New Year plays that were extremely popular at the time uh, and involved uh, offerings to folk deities. Filipinos often attended these plays, sparking fear that they were slipping away from Catholic dogma. Any Chinese violating the ban would be fined 20 pesos, forfeit their costumes, be whipped 200 times, perform forced labor for a year, and then be exiled from the colony forever. In 1594, Philip II issued a royal edict urging that unconverted Chinese be kept separate from Filipino New Christians. That same year, rebuking, uh, uh, letters rebuking Chinese rites, ceremonies, and idolatries reached even the desk of an inquisitor uh, of the Holy Office in Mexico City. During a visit in May of 1603, three Chinese administrators from the mainland also attempted to assert legal rituals of control and possession in Manila. They had traveled to the Philippines to supposedly follow up on a rumor that the port of Cavite was, in fact, a mountain of gold. Since the Philippines were formerly tributary states in the Chinese imperial imaginary, the residents owned, owed their overlords a portion of the gold. Upon arrival, the officials made a grand impression, going everywhere with an elaborate procession of armed guards, archers, executioners, litter bearers, scribes, ministers of justice, musicians, and announcers. They quickly set about persecuting Chinese Christians and those who collaborated with the Spanish regime like translators. For even minor transgressions, the officials punished both Chinese and Filipinos at will with no regard for Spanish jurisdictional authority. According to one witness of a public whip whipping, all were afraid because a quote, barbarian made justice in the land of our Lord, end quote. And here we, we see the importance of the right to punish uh, to the identity of a colony. After the officials departed, Spanish fears of an imminent Chinese invasion would set in motion a series of events that would end in massacre by the end of the year. The prospects of Chinese sexual alliance and ritual control in the colony threatened Spanish uh, authority with alternate modes of assimilation. Even the most Hispanicized Chinese, the most Christian, were feared. And these were a class of powerful land-owning and slave-owning Chinese Christians that had become spectacularly wealthy during the 1590s as the new intermediaries between Fujianese merchants and Spanish authorities. The most influential of these were Alonso Saulo, Miguel Ciante, Miguel Lucico, Jerónimo Sachuan, Miguel Onte, Gaspar Pacheco, and above all, Enkang, also known as Juan Baptista de Vera. Kang alone owned 12 sugar mills, a sugar refinery, and co-owned half of the salt fields of Nabotas with Gaspar Pacheco. Miguel Onte and Alonso Sayo owned sugarcane plantations in Pasay and San Francisco del Monte, respectively. So put together, this group ran sugar and agricultural operations with over 100 slaves, hundreds if not thousands of poor field hands, and participated directly in trade to uh, central Mexico through hired Spanish intermediaries. These impressive land holdings, coupled with Chinese and Jesuit displacement of local elites in Quiapo from 1601 to 1603, 
meant that the largest landowners in Manila area, in the Manila area at the time were Chinese. These were among the wealthiest residents of the colony and regularly lent money to the Spanish treasury when it fell into debt as often happened. It is precisely the confluences of land possession, non-Catholic sexual alliance, demographic distribution, uh, and cultural and legal ritual that allow us to recharacterize the Chinese in Manila as co-colonial forces who are economically interdependent with the Spanish system. The 1603 war that eradicated the Parian, which of course we see in the easternmost side of uh, our map here, right here, uh, that eradicated the Parian and the Chinese population immediately and brutally eliminated these existential threats with the initial exception of the Chinese landowners. After the fighting, 400 Chinese Christians returned to Manila from hiding and were pardoned. But it was unacceptable for this community to retain their previous power and influence in the colony. En en Kang, uh, the most powerful of this group, became the scapegoat for the rebellion and was summarily executed. He maintained his innocence to the very end. In the subsequent days, his estate was confiscated and auctioned off among Spanish officials and traders. Uh, and during the next few years, the other landowners were forced to sell their lands for a fraction of their worth to the colony under the pretext that they were necessary to construct the University of Santo Tomas. Eng Kang's daughters, who had married Filipino men, uh, would follow suit. And these blatant land appropriations lasted into the 1620s and dramatically redistributed both wealth and power in and around Manila, concentrating it in Spanish hands for the first time. This brief rereading of colonial society in Manila at the turn of the 17th century invites us to reassess categories of analysis and traditional approaches to the archive. The old frameworks of empire and Hispanization stumble in the face of Chinese demographic superiority and influence in the Philippines compared to Spaniards at the turn of the 17th century. Uh, this rereading further challenges us to act against the colonial Spanish archival gaze and provincialize the reach and power of Spanish institutions, religious dogma, and capacity for assimilation. Such analyses reveal drastic differences between Spanish imperial imagination on the one hand, uh, which was totalizing and universalizing, and actual territorial presence on the other. So I find it much more compelling to interpret the early modern Philippines as a contact zone a space of competition, of co-colonization, economic interdependence, syncretic religious practices, and adaptation in the face of global change. This porousness, fluidity, and hybridity must ultimately recalibrate categories of analysis to accurately reflect the vast limitations of Spanish colonial influence in the region at the time. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. and. Um, uh, since it's uh, 2.20 a.m. in Spain, where I am, uh, I'm going to limit myself to give my 15-minute paper. And then if you have any question for me, actually, I would appreciate if you can drop me a line later. I will share my uh, email on the, on the chat. And uh, again, since the time difference is so inconvenient for us being in Spain now, I apologize in advance if I cannot make it to the end of the panel. I apologize especially to my co-panelists uh, uh, who are talking after me, Rocio and Richard. Okay, and having, having said that, I'm going to share uh, my PowerPoint presentation, um, which I think you can see now. And let me put now the slideshow from the beginning. Uh, so yeah, here we are. Um, this is meant to be a, a bridge presentation, as it were, between the talk by Diego and the talks of uh, Richard and Rocio, which are more focused on uh, the 19th and the 20th centuries. Now, and by this, I mean that my research, and specifically the article on which this paper is based, is trying to, to connect or to find links or common ground between uh, early modern texts about the Chinese in the Philippines under 19th century counterparts. You know, and this is why the, the complete title of my paper is Sinophobia in the Spanish Philippines, Argensola Beyond the 17th Century, because I'm studying how the major 17th century chronicle by Argensola was read and how it influenced uh, 19th century 
authors. No? So this is a paper uh, which is uh, based on my work on history of racism. And in this sense, I think a good starting point is to start with, with a definition of racism, which basically I'm, I'm borrowing from Francisco Betancourt. So I understand racism as prejudice concerning ethnic descent coupled with discriminatory action. And the idea is, of course, that there, there's sinophobia, uh, broadly speaking, whenever these two conditions, the prejudice and the discrimination, uh, are met against people from China. In this sense, uh, my uh, the, the key text on which I will be focusing today is this uh, pamphlet by Ramon Jordana, La Inmigración China and Filipinas, Chinese Immigration in the Philippines. Ramon Jordana was a Spanish engineer who spent 12 years in the Philippines from 1873 to 1885. And then when, when he returned to Spain, uh, uh, he published this pamphlet in which he argued very strongly against uh, Chinese immigration. No? And there are three aspects on which he focused, the political aspects of Chinese immigration, the moral aspects, and also the economic aspects. And these are the aspects in which I'm, that I'm going to analyze uh, in my paper today. But I'm not, as I said, I'm not so, I'm interested in, in these 19th century discourses against Chinese immigration. Uh, but I'm even more interested in the in the in how they quote and how they use early modern sources, you not know, in order to strengthen this discourse against Chinese immigration. And in this respect, interestingly, uh, the two main sources or the two main early modern sources uh, that we have about the Chinese in Manila are explicitly quoted by this 19th century. Um, uh, author, Jordana. No? The first uh, of these quotes is, of course, Argensola's Conquista de las Islas Malucas. Uh, Argensola was an armchair historian. I suspect he never saw a Chinese person in his entire life. I mean, the farther east he went was Italy. Uh, but then he was, he had like royal patronage. He, has, uh, he had access to the archives of, uh, of the royalty in Spain, and he used uh, those archives in order to produce this book about the Spanish conquest of the Spice Islands, uh, the Moluccas, we would say nowadays. Uh, and this is a, an important book with several references to the Chinese in the Philippines. And note how deferential uh, Jordana is. So he says, Argensola, autor de una historia en que detalladamente se relatan estos hechos. And then he proceeds to explain uh, many of the historical events that Diego Luis was telling us uh, in his uh, previous talk, no? particularly the 1603 um, uh, insurrection of the Chinese of the Parian in Manila. So Jordana is very deferential to these early modern authors. And basically, the assumption he's working uh, with is that uh, something must be true if it was written in earlier times. Uh, uh, and then the, the second, the other uh, main early modern source about the Chinese in Manila is, of course, the monumental book uh, Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, which coincidentally appeared also in 1609, but not in, in, in Madrid, but in, in Mexico City. Uh, and this is also a book which is uh, often quoted in this 19th century pamphlet by Jordana. No? He says, El Dr. Morga, persona de gran respetabilidad por su ilustración y por el importante cargo oficial que en Filipinas había desempeñado. In, as a matter of fact, Morga was uh, one of the most, he ended up being one of the most corrupt officials in the administration of the Spanish uh, Empire in the 17th century. But these are details that, that are not relevant to Jordana, who instead emphasizes this uh, supposed or alleged respectability of the character. No? And again, he quotes him often in order to sustain some of his ideas about the Chinese. No? I've been more, uh, I, my work has been more focused on the influence of Argensola in the 19th century, in 19th century Sinophobic discourses. In this sense, there are three uh, books of his uh, conquest, of his Conquista de las Islas Molucas, of his conquest of the Spice Islands, which are relevant. You have them here on the, on the slide. No, there's a description of China, the end of book four, which is a very I would say idealizing description of China. It's following the tradition of the Cathay of, of Columbus and Marco Polo. This is not so relevant for the 19th century uh, Sinophobic discourses, which instead are much more focused 
on this point number 213, the 1593 mutiny on board the, to the Spice Islands, where a group of Chinese sailors uh, murdered uh, the governor Gomez Perez das Mariñas. Uh, and then the, finally, the 1603 Manila insurrection, which was uh, referred to by my colleague uh, Diego uh, Luis. So let's see how, how these um, early modern sources, what kind of role they, they play in Jordana's pamphlet. Uh, I'm going to show you some examples. As, as usual, I will be reading the quotes in Spanish, but you have, uh, I have provided English translations of everything. No? So this is in, in chapter two of the book when Jordana is uh, discussing the, what he describes as the political aspects of Chinese immigration, but it, this is mostly a, a chapter devoted to history, no? And for instance, uh, there's this reference to the events of 1593, as I uh, told you, this was the mutiny on board of a ship en route to the Spice Islands where some Chinese sailors murdered the governor Gomez Perez das Mariñas, no? And Jordana quotes this, uh, his early modern source, which is Argensola, and he refers to the sangriento drama de 1593 en que los chinos dieron prueba evidente de su rebelde condición. No. Basically, he retells the whole story again, but he tells it like in anger, almost as if it had happened the day before, when in fact this Chinese mutiny was an event that had happened like 300 years earlier, no? that he seems to manage to, to get angry about it. And he, he, of course, Argensola is his main source, and then the idea that the message that he's trying to convey is that there's something rebellious uh, in the nature of the Chinese, which make them uh, prone to this kind of, of treacherous or, or rebellious activities, no? so, such as murdering a governor. So instead of understanding that there, there were perhaps reasons why the, these Chinese, Chinese sellers behaved the, the way they did, uh, he, he elaborates, uh, he develops an essentialist discourse according to which all Chinese by nature are rebellious. You know? And he says that also in the second bullet point, you have a, another illustration of this point. Según su costumbre, los chinos emplearon para la ejecución de su plan la traición. You know? So again, this, this idea of treason as being something typically Chinese. You know? which as a matter of fact, you already find, one can already find these ideas in early modern sources, particularly in the two books that I mentioned, Argensola and Morga. But of course, Jordana being in the late 19th century, his geo-historic uh, perspective is much broader. And therefore, I would argue that his essentialism is more explicit and proudly self-aware. You know? And interestingly, there's another point of common ground between these early modern sources and the late 19th century text by Jordana is this idea, this, this kind of paranoid idea of, 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 the, of the Spanish Philippines being in constant threat of a Chinese invasion. Uh, he says in this very same chapter, he refers to a plan de conquista fraguado en China y que por fortuna no pudo uh, realizarse. No? So, uh, this is an idea that we find in Argensola already, especially after the 1603 uh, extermination of the Parian and of the, most of the Chinese inhabitants of Manila, the Spaniards were very anxious that uh, Ming China would retaliate. So you can, you can see that in many contemporary sources of the early 17th century, that there was this fear that the Chinese could invade the Philippines at any point. And you go to this 19th century text of Jordan, and he's still like, like feeding on the same, on the same fear. No? In the sense, I would say that this early modern anxiety about a possible uh, Chinese invasion of, of the Philippines uh, becomes in the 19th century, the so-called uh, yellow peril, uh, topos. No? I mean, of course, the idea of this alleged yellowness of, of the Chinese is, that is a later invention. But both periods share the common ground of, of having this kind of anxiety or this fear vis-a-vis uh, -vis a possible uh, Chinese uh, invasion. And then what I find very interesting as well from the viewpoint of race uh, uh, thinking is that this uh, uh, representation of the, of the Chinese as a threat, as a constant threat, coexists with another other uh, racist topoys such as this idea of the Chinese as being uh, una nación débil y pusilánime, no? being weak and covered, Chinese being weak and covered. Uh, my colleague uh, 
uh, Diego Luis has mentioned the, the Spanish accusations to the Chinese that they were accused of engaging in the sin of, of sodomy, no? el, el pecado nefando. Uh, so there was this, this association of the Chinese with, uh, or Chinese men with homosexuality. Uh, and then in the, one find that in early modern sources and in 19th century sources as well, this idea of, the, of Chinese men as not being uh, particularly masculine and therefore as not being good warriors, etc. cetera. You know? So uh, the, 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 China, the Spanish sources are, are contributing, are, are creating this, this idea, this representation of the Chinese man. And this coexists with the idea of, chi of China as being a constant dangerous threat. You know? So as you, can, as you can see, there's not much of a, of a consistency here, but I would argue that that's typical of, of racist thinking, you know? that piling up topoi or cliches about a minority like that without even bothering to making those, those cliches uh, consistent with one another. Um, and then uh, when it comes to the moral and economic aspects of Chinese immigration, well, the key idea, the key message that we find both in early modern and 19th century sources is the idea that the Chinese immigrants in Manila are, they constitute a very negative influence on the Filipino, on the on native Filipinos. Of course, the examples on how this negative influence uh, plays out are, 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 are different in each period, like 19th century authors would talk about gambling or opium, whereas that's not necessarily uh, the case. And in the early modernity, of course, they are more, in the early modernity, they are more worried about the, the religious influence no, of the Chinese in Southeast Asia. But the key idea of them being a negative influence, that's basically, uh, it's basically the same on both periods. And when it comes to the economic aspects of Chinese immigration, well, uh, here you have uh, an, uh, I would say a very powerful metaphor of how Jordana and many of his 19th century contemporaries saw the Chinese. No? The, he says that the Philippines is un árbol vigoroso con el tronco plagado de insectos, no? like a vigorous tree full of insects. So unlike early modern chronicles who at least acknowledge the very important contribution of of the Chinese community to the colony. Uh, Jordana is not willing to acknowledge any of that. No, and basically he compares the Chinese to insects, which is, uh, I would say, a much more aggressive imaginary no, than, than its early modern counterparts. And in fact, Jordana was widely read and quoted in late 19th century Spanish newspapers in Manila. And his uh, racist comparison actually uh, was just one of many. Here is an example, I mean, I've been reading several numbers of the Diario de Manila a newspaper from 1889. And you can see how the Chinese were compared to all these various uh, animals and insects and illnesses. No? Uh, and in this sense, the, the, the most, uh, I would say the most uh, remarkable journalists uh, when writing like very aggressive racist pieces against the Chinese was precisely Pablo Fefet. Pablo Fefet, you might know him because of his, uh, controversy with the national hero of the Philippines, Jose Rital. Uh, Fefet quoted Jordana extensively, and he was also familiar with some of these early modern chronicles, but he goes farther than any of the sources that I have mentioned so far. Now here you have an example, of course, which is a very 19th century, you know, with this reference to the, to the alleged yellowness of, of, of the Chinese, which you would never find in a, an early modern source. Early modern authors saw the Chinese as, as white as, as themselves. And finally, there's this opposition between civilization and barbarism, which again is very, is very 19th century. No, like the the uh, idea of of a threat, like many of his contemporaries, was uh, to uh, encourage white European immigration at the expense of the of the Chinese who were living at his time in, in Manila. In conclusion, I'm not denying the the difference, of course, the between the early modernity and the modernity from 19th century onwards, particularly when it comes to race thinking. But clearly there's much more common ground uh, between two periods uh, than is usually uh, believed. And with this, I've been talking uh, for exactly uh, 15 minutes and I will conclude. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Good day or evening to everyone. I would like to thank the organizers for putting this international conference together during this time of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And my co-panelists for inviting me to be part of this uh, distinguished panel and to all the participants attending this session. 
I'd like to start by reading an email sent to me by a Chinese Filipino uh, back in uh, 2014. Uh, so as you can see in the screen, she writes, as a Chinese Filipino um, who has had more exposure to Filipinos and has studied abroad, uh, well, I'm sorry, I'm reading from another text. So I'll read from the screen. While in Chinese school, uh, I unquestionably thought that the Chinese were better than Filipinos, that we were just more hardworking and decent. But in college, my perspective gradually changed and I realized that that sounded so ethnocentric and unfounded. <clears throat> and yet many elders still hold on to such beliefs and generalize Filipinos as lazy and irresponsible. While my parents do not have too many friends, the few that they have are the types that gossip, passively aggressively compare their children and shame those whose children are doing, doing wrong for example, if they found out that one of their friend's daughters is dating a Filipino and they will nag that friend to set her child straight. The person I'm quoting above was a graduate student doing research on Filipino Chinese intermarriages. She interviewed 16 respondents who were either second or third generation Chinese Filipinos and asked them about their experiences with dating or marrying Filipinos and to the degree that they were ostracized by their parents for doing so. She said that her research points to the fact that, quote, many Chinese parents still held racist beliefs, such as how all Filipinos are lazy, end of quote. So my paper is part of a book, um, a book chapter, which deals with the question of the lazy and indolent Filipino and the hardworking and thrifty Chinese, especially when referring to their capacity for work. I became interested in this question because such characterizations persist today in Philippine society, and I'm no stranger to such racial stereotyping, having been born and raised in a Chinese Filipino family. So now what do I hope uh, to answer in this presentation? One, how did this dichotomy of the lazy native and hardworking Chinese come about in the Philippine context? What were the reasons or justifications for such views? And how did the Spanish empire different from the US empire in its racialization of the Chinese as a laborer? <clears throat> the aim of this paper is to offer some preliminary answers to such questions from a historical perspective, that is from the late Spanish to the early American colonial periods, during which Chinese labor and migration to the Philippines, as well as to many parts of the world, grew as a result of increasing globalization. Amidst economic downturns during this period, the ubiquitous presence of quote unquote China men also spawned a rise of anti-Chinese sentiments within the communities they worked and lived. Now, what method am I using to answer this question? Um, the method with which this paper seeks to answer these questions is to examine certain texts from journalists, writers, newspaper articles, and, um, and what these sources said about the Chinese, and by extension, the Filipino and their capacity to work. Through this, I hope perspectives of the Spaniards and the Americans uh, would be, I would be able to draw their perspectives about Chinese labor. And also through my own research, I was also able to uh, come across some Tagalog and, uh, and other texts that would give us also a glimpse of Filipino and Chinese perspectives on, on labor. So for Spanish views on the Chinese, I utilize mostly Spanish sources, such as these that are listed on the screen. And uh, a couple of those have been mentioned uh, by Luis, for example. So these are just uh, selected uh, sources that I'm using for my book chapter. Um, 
I would also like to start by giving the historical timeline uh, related to Chinese labor in, in Spanish colonial Philippines. As some of you may know, Chinese laborers from the southern provinces of Fujian and Guangdong, but mostly Fujian, started arriving as early as the 16th century when the Manila Acapulco galleon, galleon trade that the Spaniards established in 1565 attracted not only Chinese merchants and artisans, but also workers who provided manual service, service such as loading goods from the Chinese junks onto the galleons. For over 300 years, people from different occupational backgrounds made up the Chinese community in Manila. Aside from traders, there were bakers, blacksmiths, butchers, carpenters, cooks, and street vendors who worked and plied the streets of the commercial center of the city, which is Binondo. A few engaged in farming. The Chinese were encouraged to settle as agriculturists and colonists outside of Manila in places like Cagayan, Nueva Vizcaya, Nueva, Nueva Ecija, Mindoro, Romblon, Masbate, Misamis, and Zamboanga. However, despite such in incentives to farm, many preferred to work in urban areas where more money could be made. This was especially true after the Spanish government opened up the Philippine economy to the world market around the late 18th century. So in this slide, uh, I'm spelling out the, 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 uh, some of the historical events that are more pertinent to my study. So beginning in the 1850s, the volume of Chinese laborers, that is those who worked in urban areas like Manila, Iloilo, or Cebu, rose with large numbers working either in a factory, warehouse, or in the docks. And the 1870s saw the rise of coolie labor immigration and according to Edgar Wickberg, consequent acceleration in Chinese immigration provoked fears of an irresistible yellow, yellow tide. He also wrote that Indios and Mestizos who could not find work in Manila were forced either to leave the city or remain single due to the economic hardships brought about by Chinese labor competition. One of the demands signed in 1886 by 5,000 people petitioned the government to stop using Chinese labor gangs for public work projects. And the period during the 1880s and 1890s saw the rise of an anti-Chinese movement and it was during the latter half of the 19th century that debates on whether to continue importing Chinese labor find their way to the writings that I had shown you in the previous slide. So how did these sources describe Chinese laborers and argued whether to continue importing them or not? So these are just uh, some, first of all, this is a photo of uh, Chinese laborers plying the streets of Manila and these are some of the uh, uh, descriptions, you know, from, from Spanish writers. Uh, uh, Yagor, for example, said that the Chinese were astute, hard workers, more intelligent than Indios, who had no understanding um, of the value of work. And this is from Comenge, rather. And, who were addicted to idleness and fun of gambling, such as cockfighting. And this is from Yagor. And then Comenge also said that Chinese laborers were sometimes differentiated by regional affiliation uh, with Macanistas, those who are from Macau, associated with certain professions. And I mentioned this because uh, oftentimes when we speak about Chinese um, uh, from the sources, they oftentimes um, conflate all of the Chinese together without giving due uh, attention to where to their re regional affiliation. And I think that this is important uh, when I proceed with my work that uh, the Chinese would be differentiated. Those from, the, from Fujian uh, looked at, at themselves differently from those who came from Macau or from uh, Canton and vice versa. And uh, some of the sources also said that uh, Spaniards and white men in general are not able to work in the land in the tropics. And Comenge, for example, wrote that Spanish soldiers who were stationed in Manila had a high mortality rate compared to local soldiers. Um, 
How can I? Okay. Now, um, there are also reasons given by Spaniards as well as by uh, locals as to why, uh, as trying to explain the indolence of the natives and the energetic spirit of the Chinese. And these are some of the examples. For example, in uh, 1800, Augustinian missionary Joaquin Martinez Zuniga attributed the laziness of Filipinos to diet such as fish, sugar, cane, or coconut. And some also attributed their laziness to the topography and climate. And uh, illustrators like Jose Rizal uh, would try to give their own explanation. For example, Rizal said that natives were industrious, but he blames the Spanish government for not creating the right incentives for the, for the natives to engage in agriculture or commerce and the Catholic Church for turning them into clerks, devout, praying, loving, and not the tanned and muscular laborers. Um, another illustrado, Gregorio Santianco, did not believe that Indios were lazy as proven by examples in certain regions in the country, pointing out, for example, that Visayans were populating Mindanao and developing its lands, and that people abandoned their lands because they were not not because that they were lazy, but because uh, they had to flee due to Spanish abuses. Um, so in, in some, uh, I quote from Maria Dolores Elizalde, the Chinese, the anti-Chinese attitude of the Spaniards transcended the colonial administration and was very much present in the Philippine press. The debate on the advantages and disadvantages is well illustrated in several contemporary publications. Most newspapers kept the anti-Chinese campaign alive with the exception of El Comercio, the only newspaper to express a supporting view of Chinese immigration. The anti-Chinese campaign was especially reflected in Spanish conservative newspapers and can be seen in Rafael Comen's uh, Cuestiones, Cuestiones Filipinas, Ramon Jordana's La Inmigración China and Filipinas, Jose Felipe Del Pan's articles for La Oceania Española, which was later published in the book Los Chinos and Filipinas. So most were uh, anti-Chinese immigration, but also called for limitations. Unlike the policy in, policies implemented in the United States, the plan was not to completely exclude the Chinese but to restrict their movement and to control those who remain in the Philippines. Oh, sorry. Um, now we go to the American uh, colonization or American colonial period. So before we talk about American racial, racial views of the Chinese in the Philippines, it's uh, important to know uh, that the United States also had its own Chinaman question uh, back in the 19th century. So um, in the mid 19th century, uh, large numbers of Chinese came to um, take advantage of the gold rush. And then later on, they, after the mines dried up, they uh, became railroad workers and also engaged in other occupations that resulted in the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1892, uh, which excluded Chinese laborers from coming into the United States. And that act was renewed in, 19, in 1892 and then in 1902. And then when um, General Elwell Otis uh, landed in the Philippines, uh, he in September of 1898 extended the Chinese Exclusion Act to the Philippines. And in the United States, the US Congress, as I mentioned, renewed the Chinese Exclusion Act in 1902 and extended this law to cover Hawaii and the Philippines. And during this time, um, the debates intensifi intensified uh, about whether the law should be implemented or not. And it was only in 1904 that the law was extended indefinitely in the US and in the Philippines. Now, 
these source these are the some of the sources that I used for my research. Uh, they vary from newspaper articles to government records. Um, and in terms of newspapers, I utilized Philippine-based newspapers such as the Manila American and also US-based newspapers like San Francisco called the New York Times, et cetera. So from these sources, I called or summarized some of the um, representations of Chinese laborers. And this is just one example uh, from the Manila American that came out in 1903. So I quote, the Chinese are extraordinary creatures, not like human folks like you and me. They can stand the heat down in the fire room that makes the chief engineer lie down and swears that they can stand the cold and they don't eat nothing much but rice. We don't carry Chinamen on deck in this ship. All of them belong in the fire room squad and I don't have any dealings with them. So um, apart from racializing the Chinese, they also racialize themselves in saying that Americans and the white men are not able to work in the land of the tropics and they could not compete with the Chinese who with their yellow skin and debasing habits of life seem to them hardly fellow men at all, but evil spirits rather. So these are just some of the examples of uh, how they racialize the Chinese. At one point, uh, some like General Hughes even suggested that quote unquote Negro labor be sent to the Philippines if Chinese labor could not be utilized. Um, so in the end, uh, the decision was to extend the Chinese Exclusion Act to the Philippines. Uh, and the reason for this was that they thought that, even if they thought that the Filipinos were indolent, that they could be trained by the Americans to become effective working men. And uh, the American colonial government really uh, set out to implement or create the um, the structure or the institutions to oversee Chinese immigration. And, uh, and I would argue that compared to the Spani Spanish uh, regime, uh, the Americans really uh, created a, an extensive, a very extensive and uh, <clears throat> a more, uh, more well calibrated uh, immigration system. Uh, as an example of this, uh, the uh, Bureau of Immigration came out with circulars numbering more than 200 from 1901 to 1908, just, just uh, laying out or setting down policies uh, pertaining to Chinese labor. And if, I'm not saying though that the, the Chinese, uh, that the Americans were successful um, because even in 1909, five years after the Chinese Exclusion Act was already extended, or implemented in the Philippines, they were still talking about or debating about whether Chinese labor should come in. Um, so this is an example of a cartoon from 1920 where um, one, one Senator Kalau uh, was, was proposing that the Chinese laborers be uh, imported to the opposition of the uh, Agricultural Congress of the Philippines. So um, having talked about the American and Spanish views of the Chinese, I, I just wanted to point out quickly that in my own research, I also found some Filipino uh, perspectives. And this is from the Union Obrera Democratica, uh, the first labor federation in the country that was formed in 1902 by uh, Isabella de los Reyes um, and, and other Filipino labor leaders. And uh, for example, in, in the newspaper El Renacimiento, uh, there was a meeting of all the labor union uh, members and they were echoing or voicing the same sentiment against the Chinese, saying that the Chinese should not enter the Philippines. Um, and so this, this kind of uh, argument echoes the American um, view that Chinese labor becomes a competition to Filipino labor. And uh, so, some of the, um, some other newspapers also uh, talked about 
Filipino views of Chinese labor. And, and one of them said that, um, that the Chinese were a threat to Filipino identity because many Filipino women like Chinese men. In other words, in my previous work, I saw that I demonstrated that many Filipino women intermarried with Chinese, Chinese men. And, and so um, this was looked, upon, looked down upon by Filipino men. And another example of a Filipino a newspaper or, uh, had this dead, uh, headline saying, Ang Peste Bubonica, uh, Dalawang Imchik. And this was from April 23 of 1903, where this is a translation. Uh, the Chinese sanitary inspectors in charge of overseeing the large number of Mongolians in Manila apprehended two in sick who were stricken by the bubonic plague, one of them on Nueva Street and another on San Fernando Binondo. The two were sent to San Lazaro Hospital and their houses were sprayed with medicine designed to kill the microbe so that these don't become infectious. And it was strictly prohibited that neighbors visit each other, not visit each other. I'm sorry, and it was strictly prohibited that neighbors visit each other lest they infect each other. So um, I'm just trying to, to, to jump on. So, uh, so the preliminary observations regarding Spanish and American views on the Chinese labor, that the dichotomy of the lazy native and hardworking Chinese started during the Spanish colonial period and persisted through the American colonial period. And under American colonial rule, the indolent Indio became the indolent Filipino and also transformed the Chinese community into a predominantly mercantilist community starting to link the Chinese and a Filipino identity with capital. And I also argued that Chinese and Filipino nationalisms in the 20th and 21st centuries contributed to the prevalence and persistence of such racial markers, and that especially at the time, and, it's, and that especially at the time of national or global crisis can be utilized and reutilized to demonize the other. So today, uh, when you talk about Chinese, uh, oftentimes you don't see any more or think any more of a Chinese as a laborer, but you think of them as a tycoon. And so this has, this, this was brought about by the Chinese Exclusion Act, which uh, again, uh, prohibited any Chinese laborers from coming in. So that more and more Chinese who came in were either real merchants or then, or then, or they pretended to become merchants um, or became merchants over time. So, um, I, it, to some, I have tried to demonstrate in the preceding sections how the Filipinos and Chinese were racialized in relation to their capacity to work as a way to understand the origins or historical roots of contemporary stereotypes of the Filipino as lazy and the Chinese as hardworking. I did so by examining certain publications from the late Spanish and early American colonial periods, these two periods in which there was a heightened discussion on the salience or importance of utilizing Chinese labor in order to, uh, to achieve colonialist goals. For the Spanish colonial state, the context in which Filipino indolence was discussed in juxtap juxtaposition to Chinese diligence was as um, Syed Alatas pointed out, it's turned toward a more export-oriented economy and thus necessitating more, more able-bodied men to perform manual labor. Although the sentiment may be to put a limit to Chinese labor immigration to the Philippines, Spain at that time was not unable, Spain at that time was unable to come up with a policy that resolved what some saw as an invasion Amarilla, because of its preoccupation with its own with its own domestic issues. On the other hand, the Americans were faced with a conundrum, given that Filipinos were seen as being unreliable workers. How could they develop the newly acquired territory 
and establish a robust economy without Chinese labor. In other words, how could the American colonial state balance its goals between developing the economy of the Philippines, which necessitated having a supply of dependable and cheap labor from the Chinese, and pacifying both local, that is Filipino, and domestic, that is American, opposition to Chinese labor immigration. So thank you very much. I would like to start explaining the title of my presentation, which is Peripheries Want to Go West. Um, by peripheries, I meant initially uh, the Philippines and Spain, and by West, uh, well, go West does not refer in this paper to that old movie with Harold Lloyd, uh, and it doesn't even refer to a place. So, um, as so many other authors earlier on, so Eduardo Quintan and Adenel Sigal and Milka Batista-Fayda. Um, the, the West, I mean the West as a project um, by which uh, the Orient is defined. And the Orient is perceived as homogeneous in its difference and its backwardness, mysterious, savage in comparison to the self attributed civilization of the West that is also uh, rational and progressive. So in this talk, I was going to approach uh, three literary works um, and explore the racial considerations made of the Orient with respect to the place where the writers are located, and the works uh, where La Odisea de Singa, the Odyssey of Singa, uh, by the Filipino writer Guillermo Gomez Pinta um, from uh, 1921, La Otra by the Spanish writer Ramon Gomez de la Serna, uh, written or published in 1923, and El Drama de la Señorita Occidente, the drama of Miss Occident. Um, published by the Spanish Cuban writer Alfonso Hernández Cata, also in 1921. Um, however, due to time constraints and, um, well, um, yeah, I was a bit ambitious, I realized, and, and I have just decided to leave it uh, in, in um, I, I will just approach um, 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 La Otra Raza, the other place, by Ramón Gómez de la Serna. Um, actually, the um, two last novels uh, were reviewed by the Filipino writer and Dr. Alejo Valdez Pica in an article on the narrative of Guillermo Gomez. So Valdez Pica lamented the image that Filipinos portrayed in the Cuban and Spanish show novels. Um, and you have my translation of his text there. It was originally in Spanish. And uh, he's um, saying that in the first one, so El Drama de la Señorita Occidente, the author uh, describes uh, us Filipinos with Chinese names and habits. And the second one, La Otra Raza, the other race, depicts us as samurais. I don't want to see in this absurdity anything but ignorance, unforgivable in Spanish writers of the statue of those mentioned, because to suppose all the causes and reasons for what they have written would be to suppose at the same time that there are still in Spain those who can see in us, nothing but miserable and idyllic Indians, sour and ferocious with no other motive than instinct and no other characteristics than those of an inferior race. Then, uh, from Valdez Pica's remarks, um, this article will explore uh, two main ideas. So, on the one hand, uh, the possibility that European and US discourses circulating are assumed to depict Asia and China. Uh, in order to associate Spain as a peripheral country to the West. And on the other hand, the social and historical situations that led the Spanish author to orientalize the Philippines in a movement uh, which has been called by Milica Bakichaiden, uh, nesting orientalisms. And uh, well, I was also initially going to explore why the Filipino orientalizes China in La Odisea de Singa, which is a short novel included in La Carrera de Candida, um, the book you can see uh, on the slide by Guillermo Gomez uh, But well, that will be hopefully um, included in a full version of, of the paper uh, to also dialogue with this chapter that we have to, um, just presented. Then, uh, Nesting Orientalism is a process uh, by which a culture ha that has been discursively included in the Orient. Um, orientalizes other cultures. So for instance, Spain along the 19th century 
and then the 20th century is heavily orientalized in painting and literature by German, French, uh, British, and even American authors. And I am, for instance, thinking of uh, the Tales of Alhambra by Washington Irving. Um, and um, yeah, this is a, an idea that I would like to take into account because in this case, Spain is not an imperial power in the 1920s and is being orientalized and at the same time is orientalizing other cultures and regions. Then to explore the application to the triangular relation Spain, Philippines, China, I depart from three ideas explored by members of the Alter Research Group, which is a research group in Universitat Oberta de Catalunya, uh, to which I also belong. Um, and this, these ideas were especially explored by Carlos Prado Pons and Javier Ortiz Nicolau. Then uh, the first idea is that uh, during the colony, Manila was a hub that centralized peoples and objects from China and Japan, which uh, And then thanks to this contact, the supposed mystery and remoteness uh, of China with respect to Spain was not so much at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century. So Spanish people were quite well acquainted with the uh, China Sowa, like the, the objects coming from uh, the Philippines, um, uh, which at the same time came from different parts in Asia. Um, then, second idea is due to the trade of objects and the large Chinese presence in the Philippine archipelago, the representations of China in the Spanish collective imagination were put to the Philippine experience. And then uh, from 1898 uh, onwards, the redefinition of Spain's identity as a non imperialist country also led to a redefinition of its relationship with other countries in Europe. And as I was saying, it became a, a peripheral and orientalized country. Therefore, the orientalist vision exercised from Spain over the Philippines that we will see in Gomez de la Serna novel uh, is inserted in this process I was describing of nesting orientalism. So, and here is the third idea. In order to imagine Asia from the periphery of of Europe, Spanish writers tended to resort to the mediation of the representations shaped by English, French, and German that circulated in the last years of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. And this replication of European discourses in the representation of China that uh, have been studied by uh, my two colleagues uh, will serve in turn to Spain to identify this possibly with the modernity linked to a European identity and therefore um, so um, the sudden rise of the Chinese presence in European cultural field in the 1920s created in turn a small boom in Spanish literature and China. And um, in these words, um, the Philippines, which had been central for years in the Spanish experience of Asia, had an almost testimonial role in some of them as a necessary stop on the way to in China or to Japan. So with Spanish costumbrista literature of the late 19th century tended to foreground the commercial possibilities for Spaniards in the Philippines um, and the fact that it was a part of Spain in Asia and um, these uh, economical uh, insights have been um, studied by uh, William Aridi. Um, well, uh, then uh, it seems that some of the literature of the 1920s in the Philippines tended to dilute the importance of the connections between Spain and the archipelago. And the Philippines would fall then conceptually for the Spaniards within East Asia and get identified with China and Japan instead of to the Spanish speaking world. Then uh, um, the orientalization denounced by Valdez Pica seems to respond to an intention of racial separation that has to do with some developments from the last third of the 19th century. During those years, uh, Herbert Spencer, and we have some of his books there, was the second most translated author in Spain, and his ideas on social Darwinism in the survival of the fittest were apparently constantly reproduced in the books and had a consistent echo in the Spanish writers of the time. So as it was happening in the rest of Europe, Spanish writers explored the possibilities of Darwinism in terms of the interaction between the natural and the social environment. And this, with other associated circumstances of political decline, led in the words of John D. Blanco to a reaffirmation of a sovereign division between Spaniard and native subjects. La Otra Raza uh, was published during a re-emergence of social Darwinism and racial 
the time of Darwin's birth anniversary in 1909. And it had great repercussion in the emerging middle class who sought to consolidate its role as a dominant social class and uh, who, for this purpose, relies on scientism in a way that serves to justify the authority of the elite. And that Spanish middle class was, on the other hand, still recovering from the psychological and patriotic shock of the so called 1898 disaster. As a reaction, there was a will to Europeanize and modernize Spain according to the De Generacionista postulates, which assume European epistemologies in terms of social and international borders. Um, then, uh, now focusing on Gomez de la Serna's work, he can definitely not be accused of ignorance over the Philippines. Uh, because he was the son of Javier Gómez de la Serna. And Javier Gómez de la Serna had been born uh, in the waters of the Philippine archipelago, um, where his father also lived. And then years later, Javier Gómez de la Serna was a civil servant for, for 11 years in the Philippines. And upon his return to Madrid, uh, he uh, continued uh, in contact with the illustrators living there at that time. So he was friend of uh, Rizal, uh, or at least had a relation and discussions. And uh, he wrote the prologue to uh, Rizal's biography prepared by Dana. Um, and then he was also a friend of Juan Luna. And Ramón Gómez de la Serna, because of all these episodes of his childhood, uh, when uh, this was going to visit his father, uh, in his uh, autobiography called Automobile. And we have a text from that autobiography here on the slide. Um, and then um, he, he recalls in this autobiography some uh, objects uh, from his father's house. Those objects coming from the Philippines were originally though, uh, from China and Japan. And, and they are central to create a mysterious atmosphere, uh, not only in the other race, but also in uh, another novel that you can see um, the um, picture here. Uh, which was called a Chinese novel, Los Dos Marineros, uh, The Two Sailors. The plot of Lautra Raza is actually inspired in a true story told in his uh, autobiography. It's the story of the mother of Maria Pardo de Pavera at the hands of his husband, Juan Luna. So in this biography, the mother and the painter, uh, which is the same person, Juan Luna, uh, is described to be as of another race. Um, and uh, his character and the crime provoked by the frustration of not being adequately recognized in Europe and thus not fitting there. And the crime is portrayed as unavoidable. And at the end, Juan Luna is said to have gone to the forest of China following an instinct that had to do with his soul, uh, soul and his way of being. Juan Luna actually went back to the Philippines, not to China. And despite being described with a yellow flat face as a stereotypical Chinese, Ramon knew him. Then, um, Gomez de la Serna's novel begins when the Spaniard uh, Emilio Calvaro and his wife Virginia Sinisipa from Sulu uh, moved to the Philippines, uh, from the Philippines to Madrid with their two children. Uh, of their adolescent children, the girl, Dulce Nombre, looked like, their, uh, like his, well, her father. Uh, she's described with Western attributes and attitude, which the boy's face was flattened, and I'm quoting from the novel. Latin, yellow, and with a dark color that had just tinted his face as an overseas museum mask. Uh, again, my translation. So from the first pages, it becomes evident the polarization of the house between the group of those more inclined towards the West, including Don Emilio, Dulce Nombre, and Arteno Vicentes, uh, Wentes, and those who are rather affiliated to the Orient in the novel, including Vicente, Virginia Salisipa, described as a completely Indian woman without any concealment, my translation, with, uh, again quoting, the distrust of the Chinese woman who finds herself in a country that is not hers. And the Chinese maid almost always drunk. And uh, you can see her in the illustration made by Benagos for this book uh, on, the, uh, on the picture. Antagonist emerged soon. So Vicente hates his sister. The father in turn hates Vicente. Wences is secretly in love with the phenomenon. The mother and the Chinese maid spoil Vicente. And finally, Dulce Nombre is delighted and very adapted to Madrid, but she walks around the house decorated by her mother in fear. The house is described as a part of the Orient, full of mysteries and terrors, dangerous, with a 
foreign background, he said, with corridors with Chinese and Japanese masks that Dulce feared to pass through. Well, Vicente, and I again quote, walked through them with the confidence of one who belongs to the tribe. This um, is the text you can see on the slide, um, is this description. Um, so Vicente felt his identity altered and uncomfortable in the words of the house outwards, so he would rarely cross that barrier. The boundary between the in-house oriental world, where Vicente feels secure, versus the outside Western world, where he is a misfit, keeps the balance in the story. When this boundary is broken, Vicente attempts to bring the Orient to the world outside the house. During the carnival, he decides to dress in the, quoting, authentic Chinese costume that his father had brought from there. So it's Chinese, but it's Filipino. There is some confusion about the origin of the costume along the narration, and uh, you see different descriptions of it on the slide. Uh, the illustrations um, it, in, in it that you have there uh, looks more like a samurai costume, uh, while in the descriptions it's said to be, uh, I quote, a tribal chief warrior's costume in Sulu. And you have a picture of this kind of costume on the other uh, image. Uh, and then to insist that, uh, it, they insist, uh, Ramon Gómez de la Serna, where the narrator insists that it was an old Chinese warrior's costume. And finally, in the case that the costume was part of an ancestor of the family. So the tensions between the both sides of the family culminate when on the way back from the carnival, Vicente kills his sister with the sword of the warrior uh, suit, still in disguise and possessed by indignation and jealousy because Dulce would have spent the night with friends. In killing her, as the last sentence of the text says, the other race shown in him in victory and reparation. The text leaves the Filipino as inevitably dominated by a wild character spurred on by the decoration of the house that turns it into an oriental forest depicted with classical tropes, which, uh, which the landscape is describing the colonial discussion in the 19th century. The other race advocates an innate separation between Europeans and Asians, the representation of the Malays and the Spaniards as a part of the same ill advised family since a distortion of the 19th century representation of Spain as a model of the colony, as painted by Malina himself in the famous picture, The Philippines and Spain. In the case of the other race, Spain and the Philippines have ceased to be mother and daughter, to be at least generationally equal. So they are now represented as an indifferent marriage between an idyllic Filipina, who has been violent and fierce in the islands. And they are also what they have in general, two antagonistic brothers predestined to Keynesian. Vicente is doubly predestined to violence by his will race dominated by instinct, far from the rational and practical, is far from the Western values, let's say, uh, but, but also by his Spanish father, who has literally killed in Mindanao. Uh, the union between the two worlds leads to tragedy, and the message it conveys is the need for that separation. In this case, survival does not depend on adaptation. However, displacement and mixture of races causes alienation and it implies a danger to the other. On the other hand, the 19th century apprehensions that make all Oriental races equal in their degeneration also appear in the representation of the Chinese maid and the mother, Salisita, Filipino, both uh, whom are becoming increasingly, um, both, both of whom uh, are in, becoming increasingly alcohol. Then, um, in all the three wars that I intended to study, uh, the only aesthetic place is China, so which maintains this tradition. Then the magnetism of these traditions provokes the actions of the male protagonists of La, La Otra Raza and El Drama de la Señorita Occidente, by Hernando Chata, the imagination of Spain and also of the Philippines in the uh, Odyssey of Sinda by Donald Lincoln, as a transient area connects them with the dynamism and modernity of the West, as opposed to the immobility of China, Asia, dragged by tradition. Um, the objects that appear in Gomez de la Serna's text, both in La Otra Raza and in Automobilundia, um, are generally, so th this would be our first conclusion. The second conclusion would be that these objects are generally Asian and concentrate, concentrated in Hindi and sometimes interchangeably uh, Philippine, Chinese, or Japanese origin. And uh, the origin of the confusion, uh, I think, is not entirely innocent. Uh, 
Um, and it's not, it's not limited to the fact that Japanese and Chinese goods were also traded from the Philippines. So there seems to be a desire to conceptualize separate, um, uh, to conceptually separate the Filipino from the Hispanic and to ascribe it rather to Asia. And the process is orientalizing in the most classic way. So Ivo Metera Serna uses East Asia into a series of stereotypical characteristics that are related to the wild, the natural, and the mysterious. And moreover, they separate the Philippines from the Hispanic West in a deterministic process. Asian individuals from South Asia become alienated um, as Spaniards in a way were alienated in the Philippines, could be argued, because of the circumstances in which uh, the father of the family is described. Um, this would be all that I wanted to um, talk about today. And uh, my name is Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rocio. And uh, thank you to uh, all the other presenters uh, for this panel. Now the floor is open to questions from uh, everyone here in this meeting. Feel free to use the raise your hand function of Zoom. Or you may also type in your questions via chat. Are there questions for the CEO, Richard? Diego. Yes, Diego. Hello, yes. Yes, um, yes. Go ahead. Uh, well, thank you to my other panelists um, for their fascinating presentations. I had just a um, a quick uh, question for um, Rocio, if if uh, she's hanging around. Um, I know it's late over there, uh, and for Richard as well. Um, and I, I'm very interesting interested, you know, coming from the 16th, 17th century context into the 19th century context. Uh, in perceptions of Chinese uh, throughout lands claimed by Spanish Empire, uh, precisely because um, during the 19th century, for the first time, really, there are large populations of Chinese, uh, not only in the Philippines, but also in uh, Peru and Cuba uh, and, uh, and elsewhere in the Americas. And I'm wondering if in these discourses and these representations, um, we can see clearly in, in Luisa's work the, the um, uh, referencing of, of earlier text uh, coming from the Philippines. But I'm wondering if we also see those kinds of relations uh, in literature, also in you know, more journalistic or, or historical archival sources, these references to what's going on in Cuba or in Peru at the same time, if there's this kind of uh, active discourse um, about uh, uh, in representing Chinese. Um, and one thing that, that came off the top of my mind was sort of some, some of those similarities and differences uh, in representing Chinese in terms of labor in Cuba, because the reference was enslaved Africans um, versus representations of, of Chinese laborers in the Philippines where the reference was uh, native Filipino. So if, if one or both of you could speak to that, um, I'd be really interested in that. Thank you. Uh, I can try. Um, do I have to put my video on? Um, that, actually, that is a question that I need to uh, also delve deeper into in my research. Um, what I have seen so far or have uh, mined in my own research are <clears throat> these trans-imperial uh, discourses between the U.S. and the British and the Dutch uh, and the Japanese um, and their treatment of the Chinese. Uh, so this is more like uh, late 19th century, early 20th 
uh, where the the American officials were looking into the experiences of the uh, <clears throat> the Dutch, for example, colonial government in Java and how they're treating the Chinese. And then that they're also writing about each other. Um, you know, the, the British newspapers, for example, was, were closely following what the Americans were doing in the Philippines. Sadly, I haven't really gone or, or looked into 19th century Spanish sources, for example, and how um, Spanish racialized views of the Filipinos or the, the natives in the Philippines were in some ways, in many ways, uh, influenced uh, by their experience in Cuba, for example, or uh, in Peru. Um, maybe Rothio might, might have an answer to that, or Jelly Galang, I think, who's here, uh, might also, and some other scholars. Um, I, I don't have an answer. I, I have some ideas that I might share. Um, I'm, I'm thinking that, well, I, I assume uh, when I started with this research that in Cuba it would be different uh, because from the moment that um, um, uh, black slaves are forbidden, uh, police were like really were received there. And uh, like, uh, Put like Chinese labor uh, was was uh, an important asset uh, for um, well for, for the plantations. And for, but uh, actually, uh, the third author that uh, I was going to, to talk about, uh, um, Hernandez Cata, is a Cuban accidentally born in Spain, but from Spanish father and Cuban mother, but he's considered to be a Cuban author. Um, and, and he's actually um, portraying the, the Chinese in the Philippines and the, well, the Philippines and, and the Asians as well, uh, in a very similar way to Gomez de la Serna. Um, so um, in, in that case, uh, in El Drama de la Señorita Occidente, um, the perception is uh, also like very deterministic and uh, very um, yeah, uh, talking about the, the aggressiveness or the, the uh, wildness uh, um, of, of the uh, Asian race and the, the Easterns uh, and the opposition to, to La Señorita Occidente, Miss Occident. So uh, it is, it is uh, surprising for me. And uh, um, I also recall some other writing, I don't know if it doesn't come to my mind, uh, in which um, they were also uh, criticizing. So a group of Cubans were criticizing uh, in, in Acayo, um, working in Acayo, were criticizing uh, the arrival of uh, Chinese people to work in this Acayo. And then uh, there were more Chinese coming up uh, to this guy in Cuba. And then, um, yeah, as soon as they uh, kill or expel that group of Chinese, another one came. Um, and uh, it was a, a similar perception to that of the threat uh, for the laborers th uh, from there. Um, but this is literature, so uh, uh, I, I am not sure. So probably some of the people could bring some more insights into it. Thank you, Rocio. Thank you, Richard. Richard, there are two questions for you here in the chat box. Uh, mm -hmm. First is from Teresita Angsi. Uh, she's asking you, are there any figures on unemployment during American occupation? The 1930 report on rehab of opium addicts showed 90% of those on rehab were unemployed. And then a second one from Jelly Galang asking you, were there any recorded violent confrontations? during the height of anti-Chinese campaigns in the 1880s to the 1890s? Uh, for the first question, uh, Tessie, I, I haven't really come across myself, uh, but I would, uh, I would uh, assume that census records, uh, the US census 
uh, record of uh, 1908 and I think 1918 uh, might show that if, uh, if you're asking about unemployment of Filipinos, I presume. Um, so, so to answer, I, I, I haven't really looked into that. Um, but I think um, your question is, uh, <clears throat> I guess, connected with the how how does importing Chinese labor affect or influence uh, Filipino employment uh, levels or statistics? Uh, you said that the 1930 report on the rehab of population. So 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 this is probably you're talking about the Chinese who are opium addicts. Um, so I would be interested in looking at that uh, statistic too. Um, I know that from Jelly Galang's uh, dissertation, it's wonderful dissertation that in the, during the 19th century, in the late 19th century, so many Chinese who came as laborers were not able to find jobs, you know, and, and they become uh, vagrants um, and were deported. So he, I don't know if uh, maybe Jelly can extend his research onto the 20th century because uh, his focus is really on, on the uh, Chinese laborers. And so to answer Jelly's ans uh, question, <clears throat> not that I have come across so far in my, in my research uh, of any uh, violent, uh, although when it comes to the Philippine uh, revolution against Spain, and also during the uh, Philippine American War, so roughly 1896 to 1902, there have been records of violence against Chinese, uh, whether it's um, burning down their houses or, or, or uh, raiding their stores or theft, you know, robbery or stealing from them. Uh, there, there, there have been records. So I hope that answers your questions. Thank you, Richard. And then the next three questions are all for uh, Diego. Uh, first one from uh, Leandro, who's part of uh, the audience of this panel. Uh, although it's more of a reaction rather than a question, uh, especially on co-colonization, uh, spatial network analysis of 1898 Manila Street and Canal Waterway Network shows that it was actually Binondo that was the integration core of the city and not Intramuros. So the spatial underlay supports the idea that Manila was a contested, co-colonized territory. Uh, next question is from Jose Dennis, who's posting uh, a question via our Facebook live feed. Was Chinese migration to the Philippines uh, can it be considered, in a sense, a colonial act? And the last question for Diego, can you speak uh, from Jesse Park? Can you speak more about the wealthy population of the Chinese engaged in running sugar plantations in the Philippines? Were the Chinese already engaged in running those plantations prior to the Spaniards' arrival in Manila? Or was their involvement in it fostered by the Spaniards? So, Diego? All right. Um, thank you very much for these questions. Um, to the first, um, uh, Leandro, uh, Leandro's comment, uh, I, I find that reference uh, completely fascinating. Um, and, uh, and it kind of reminds me a bit as well of the 1671 map that I put up uh, while I was speaking. Uh, because we see on that map how in the Spanish imaginary, the, the Parian compared to Intramuros, it looks small on the map, but we know that spatially that this was not the case. I mean, an area so small could not possibly have, have held uh, 30,000 people versus um, the several hundred Spaniards and of course their, their slaves and servants that were living 
uh, in intramuros uh, at the same time. So it's really interesting to see how, how certain discourses seek to minimize certain parts of uh, the greater Manila area precisely because they, they, were not the, they were not considered to be the Spanish core. And, and it's, this is precisely the, the Spanish perspectives that, that we often have to grapple with in the archive. Um, the second question was if uh, Chinese migration to the Philippines can be considered a colonial act. Um, and, uh, and I would say that that, that depends largely on the, on the context because we, we wouldn't consider migration under normal, any normal circumstances to be, con to be a colonial act. Uh, and, and it depends on how we define uh, colonialism. So the way that I was looking at it um, for my paper what had to do with, uh, deal with uh, land possession, um, you, you know, taking possession of land that formerly uh, belonged to native Filipino polities. Um, it had to do with enslavement. It had to do with um, cultural influence and uh, being formally considered a tributary state within a larger Chinese imperial Im imaginary. Um, so I, I don't think that under you know, normal circumstances, we can consider migration itself to be a colonial act. But within the historical context uh, that I was looking at that dealt specifically with colonial aspects of what we would consider colonialism, then um, those demographic um, patterns, historical demographic patterns, uh, do take on um, uh, other meanings. And the third question what had to do with the, the sugar uh, industry that came up um, in the northern parts of, northern areas of uh, Manila up to uh, Nabotas uh, in the late 16th century. And yes, this, this was, uh, these were Chinese merchants that had become uh, very wealthy uh, precisely because of their contact uh, and trade with um, uh, uh, Spanish uh, traders, uh, trading, you know, silver for, we, we, we know the, the old story, the silver for silk. Uh, this was how they became wealthy and acquired the, the capital to purchase um, and take possession of uh, land to the north of Manila and develop these, these massive sugar estates. Uh, and this is something that we see uh, throughout um, Spanish, I mean, sorry, uh, Chinese uh, colonial activities in Southeast Asia. Um, we see it in Dutch Batavia as well. Um, but, um, uh, but, but like I said, shortly after these industries rose uh, in the late 16th century, they were, they were quickly um, reappropriated uh, after the 1603 uprising. Um, but I'm sure we can find evidence of later periods of them coming back. But that's all I have to say on that. Uh, thank you for those questions. Thank you, Diego. And uh, the next question comes from Dr. Concepcion Lagos of University of Asia and the Pacific. She's watching our Facebook live stream. Uh, Dr. Lagos is asking uh, all panelists, so anyone from the panel can answer. Have you encountered in your research animosities in the interactions and dynamics among Chinese in the Philippines during the 15th from end of 19th centuries who located themselves in support of the Spanish, for example, Antonio Tuason, and on the other hand, in support of Limahong or uh, in support of the British when they attempted to occupy Manila. Basically, Chinese who located themselves in support of and those against the Spanish government. Anyone from the panel? Well, I would say rather as a uh, the writings of uh, the Lima Home story from a Filipino perspective. And uh, uh, one is a poem, another one is an interview. Uh, writers in Spanish. And uh, the perception is quite positive. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm now working on that. Yeah, it goes beyond this time frame that. Um, 
Um, I'll jump in here really quick. Um, um, apologies, Rosio, I couldn't hear your answer very uh, clearly. So uh, uh, my apologies if, if I repeat something that you said. Um, but uh, I think that one important, th I, I mean, in the case of, of uh, Li Wenhong and in, in the case of the 1603 uprising in particular, you do find Chinese, of course, on both sides of, of these issues, and this is, uh, uh, important to keep in mind that you know the, the Chinese community in the Philippines was not a monolith. There, there were was a highly nuanced, complex, diverse um, group of people from the earliest days. Um, you know, from the spectacularly wealthy merchants I was talking about, who collaborated very closely with the Spanish regime, um, and uh, and we can think even of the figure of Eng Kang, who. Uh, initially tried to warn the Spanish governor of an impending uprising uh, and the group of wealthy Chinese merchants that when the violence broke out they refused to join the uprising and would later uh, many of them would end up committing suicide and um, uh, and burning alive in the Parian during the, the violence so we see in these, especially in these early issues, the, the complexity of the Chinese community um, and the diversity of, of their allegiances around these conflicts. Okay. Uh, well, here's. Uh a rejoinder by Rocio. Uh, she's saying that I was saying that there, were, that there are some retellings of Limahong's story in which he is seen as a hero in poems and even unpublished novels in Spanish uh, along the 20th century or Filipino literature in Spanish. Again, uh, we are open to uh, get questions from the members of the audience in this panel. Because if not, uh, looks like uh, we no longer have uh, questions. We will end the panel here. I want to thank all our presenters, Rocio, Diego, Richard, as well as Luis, who's uh, uh, no longer here in the meeting. Thank you very much, especially to our uh, Europe-based presenters, Rocio and Luis. Uh, we are... Uh, we, we really appreciate it that you took the time despite the ungodly hours that you are uh, you're in right there in uh, in Europe. Uh, we're really sorry. Uh, this is the, the the best way we could make a compromise in the schedule. But uh, we we're, we are really thankful for uh, for accommodating uh, for accommodating us for taking the time to present your present your work. Uh, we are all. Uh, thankful for your insights, for, for asking, uh, for uh, answering the questions. And uh, with that, we, uh, we will take a break. Uh, we will begin the next session, which is our second keynote address of the conference. That is session seven, the keynote address of Father Rene Javeliana. It will begin 10, 15 a.m. Manila time. So we take a break first, uh, and we will see you. 1050. Thank you very much and have a good day.